Hey, this is Josh. In this video, we're going to go through the guessing game in the Plutus Playground tutorial. In the guessing game project, one user has to lock up their ADA with a password, and then another user has to try and guess that password and send a transaction to unlock and redeem that ADA. We're going to go through the project to understand how to implement something similar ourselves. Specifically, we're going to learn how to, one, store the ADA on the blockchain along with the string that the other user has to guess, two, create a custom data type to get data from the users. And three, we're going to implement the contract that will take those inputs and make the transactions to lock up and redeem those ADA. So without any delay, let's get started. All right, we're back into Plutus Playground. And in this video, we're going to look at the game example project. So the high level how this project works is that it's a two player game. Player one would think of a secret word and they would use that secret word and a certain amount of lovelace that they want to lock on the blockchain. And then player two would try to redeem those lovelace by guessing that specific password. And if it's correct, the smart contract will release the fund so to the second player. So if we scan through this code, we can see that there's roughly 130 lines of code, maybe 100 if we don't count the comments. And we'll go look at this later, but in the meantime, let's see how this actually plays out in the simulator. So I recompiled it. And if we look at the examples given in the simulator, in our basic game example, we have two wallets, wallet one, wallet two. They both have 100 love places. There are two endpoints, guess and lock. And what we're doing here is we're first locking 50 love places with the password Plutus. We're waiting one block to process our transaction. Wallet two would guess the password, and then we wait one block for that transaction to be validated. And then let's just evaluate and see what happens. So, all right, so we've simulated our transaction. So if we look at the final balance, we see that wallet one has 50 because it gave up 50 to wallet two, which now has 150. And that's basically all we do in this example project. So let's dive into the code and understand how to make this work. So there's a lot of ways to start digging into the code. I'm going to first start by looking into our template Haskell, where we actually create our game instance, which we'll be later use in our transactions, and kind of understand some of the data types. Game instance is a function that returns a script instance that has a parameter that you pass in of type game. You don't need to really understand too much of what the syntaxes are. A lot of this is us using Plutus TX, which is a library that the Cardano team made for Haskell, which translates our Haskell code that we write into Plutus Core, which is used on the blockchain itself. And this is accomplished by using something Haskell provides called Template Haskell. If you're not too familiar with Haskell, that's okay. The important thing is that you can actually just copy and paste this, provide your own game type, and provide your own validator script, which we'll look into later, and your datum and redeemer, which we'll also talk about later. So we know what our game instance is and what it will be used for later, but what are some of these types? Well, let's take a quick look. So the first thing is we define a game. So the game object is just a class that tells Plutus what our redeemer and datum is. How the Plutus blockchain works is there are two data structures that we pass in with our transactions, a datum and a redeemer. A datum is named for a class that the sender of a smart contract would send to the blockchain. For the guessing game, our datum is the password that the user inputs in. And then the redeemer is the data structure that any user who wants to redeem the ADA sends to the network. In the game example, this is our guess that we made. And we can see this on line 33 and 36 where it is defined. We create a new data object called game, which has two types, the redeemer type, which is defined below, and the datum type, which is also defined below. Our redeemer type is clear string. And we can see in line 24 and 26 that clear string is another class that we make. Specifically, it's a new type. And what a new type is, is it takes an existing object, which in this case is our byte string, and then we basically change it into a new class. So we make a new object called clear string, which is built on top of our byte string. They are equivalent. 
and that it is deriving, which means it is inheriting a new type, which is plus tx dot is data. You don't have to really know what this is. On high level, plus tx dot is data is just a data type that allows us to send and receive information from the user's wallet to the blockchain. And this is just a way for us to convert our code without us needing to actually implement anything. And then of course, we need to do something called make lip, which is just a way for us to convert our new class that we made to be in a language that Plus Core can understand on the blockchain. This is the same thing you do in every single project. So if you don't understand what's happening, you can just copy and paste. Now on our datum, we have another value called hash string. Without repeating myself over again, hash string is exactly the same thing as clear string. We are just repurposing a byte string and we're calling it hash string and it derives the same plus.txs data. And we also lift it so it can be used on the blockchain. So hopefully nothing too complex. So now let's go back to our script. So the next thing we want to look at is our validate guess, which is our validator script, which uses the datum and the redeemer that we defined. So here we have a validator script. So on line 55 and 56, we have a function called validate guess. It takes in three types, our datum, our redeemer, and this validator CTX, which is just metadata. We're not gonna really use it in this example. And then it returns a Boolean to indicate whether or not the transaction was successful or not. So if we look at the implementation of validate guess, we see that our hash string is going to be a variable called actual and our clear string is going to be a variable called guess. And all this code does is it compares if the actual value that original sender send is equivalent to the hash version of the guess. And if it is, we'll unlock the funds. So one thing I will note is that this SHA-2256 is a function that we imported in Haskell. And we don't necessarily see that our actual value is hashed. We'll later see in the actual implementation that we do hash it up and we send it across the network. And that's our validate script. So let's go back and take a quick recap. So right now we have defined the data types, hash string and clear string that we are storing on the blockchain. And we have a validator script, which will check if the hash string and clear string are equal. And if they are, we release the funds. That's one part of our code. But now we need to actually go to the part where we receive data from the user and send those transactions so we can use our validator script. Now that we have our validator script, let's go on and talk about getting the user's input and creating contracts. With that in mind, we look at the last four lines of code on line 126 to 131. We have three things, our endpoints function, which is something that Plutus exposes for us to show the UI for our Plutus playground. The schema definition, which we give our game schema. Uh, we'll talk about this later. And then there's MK known currency, which is just play code to get the application to run. So endpoints is a function that returns a contract object, which takes in three specific types of parameters, a game schema, E, which is explicitly bounded in Haskell to another type called as contract error, which is, you can just think of it as like a generic exception. And then the third parameter would be void or empty tuple. And as a quick refresher, what contract does with these three objects is it uses game schema to get the inputs. It returns E as an error if something happens, and it returns some parameter here, depending on the logic, which in this case is really void and we don't do anything. Let's take a quick look at our game schema that we pass in for our contract. So every contract needs a schema. And we see in schema on line 28 to 32 that game schema is just a new type, which is just a new class. And it is built from several other types. So the most generic thing we'll see is blockchain actions, which is just a bundle of generic options that every contract has that Plutus gives you to use. And then you can look into our Hello World video where we talk about contract and schema for more information about this. And along with this action, we create two endpoints, which is lock and guess. And this is a string that'll show up in our simulator. For the lock endpoint, we accept specific parameters from the user, which we define in lock params. If we look at lock params on lines 67 through 72, we see that it is a we see that it's a class that we define ourselves. And this in Haskell is something called a record, where we have a lock params class 
which takes in two parameters, a string and a value. A value is a custom class that Pluto gives us. And what a record does, it allows us to define the name of the parameters, which is secret word and amount. And the extra code we show is we have deriving stock and deriving any class. We also talked about this in some of our previous videos. Deriving stock is some generic functionality that Haskell will implement for us that we want for our param. And then any class is just specific functionality that we want. And the most important one is we have this from JSON and to JSON, where we would take the data we get from the user from our wallet and then change it into JSON. And for those who are not aware of what JSON is, JSON is a popular data formatting language that we use to transform our variables into something that we can send over the network. And so what we're doing is we're inheriting some implementation that allows us to convert our parameter into a JSON and then convert it back from a JSON. And if that's all over your head, don't worry. You can mostly just copy and paste this and your code will work just fine. And so that's where our lot params, and this is where we define our two inputs that the user gives us. And then for our guest endpoint, we have our guest params, which is exactly the same as our lot params. The only difference is we have a guest word on line 76. So now that that's defined, let's go back to our code. We create our game schema, which takes in two endpoints that we define ourselves, but we haven't written any code yet to deal with the inputs that the user gave us. All of that logic is defined in our implementation of endpoints, which we just call a function called game. So what does game look like? Let's take a peek. So game itself is a function that returns the exact same type as our endpoints. And then in the implementation of that code, we have this lock select guess. Uh, this is just some fancy Haskell syntaxing to make our code more verbose. What this really is, it's it's calling the select function, and we're given two parameters, lock and guess. And select is for something in Haskell called monads and processing IO actions. Without going too much into detail, IO actions is just a way for Haskell to receive input from users. So what basically it's saying is run one of these code based off of whatever the user selected. So let's say the user went with lock. We look at the function lock, which we can see over here. Lock itself is another function that returns that same contract that we've been passing around, not a surprise. And if we look at the implementation of lock, and this deuce keyword symbolizes that the following lines of code, A4, A5, A6, will be run sequentially and that we'll be dealing with inputs from the users. So how we read this is on line 84, we have this endpoint function that we import and we're calling the lock endpoint, which we defined, and we're expected to receive the lock params. Here's the lock params for our convenience. And then this left arrow means we are taking whatever input the user gave us and we're storing it in this variable right here. So we have our lock params variable and then we're calling our secret word secret and then we're calling our amount AMT. So the example here is pretty straightforward. All we're doing is we're sending a transaction to the blockchain to lock up our item. And to do that, we need to first create our transaction. And we do that by calling something called constraints that must pay to the script. This is something that Plutus gives us and we can just copy the code every single time. And this function takes in two things. It takes in the datum that we're storing on the blockchain for our validator script and the amount of ADA that we're locking up. So what this code here does is it calls a function called hashring, which we can see right here on line 46, and we give the parameter secret to it. So we look at the implementation of hashring, we see that it takes in a string and then it returns a class called hashring, which if you recall, hashring is our datum. And then we look at the actual implementation of hashring, it uses something called composite function, which is, if you remember your math, there's something called like f, f of g log and what that basically just means is is we're saying get the input of c.pack give that as a parameter to our function sha 2256 and give that to our next function hash string and that's what these dots symbolizes the composite function so one thing that stumped me for a while is what's our starting variable this is just a syntax that you'll learn to live with with pascal without us actually even writing the string variable that we received 
this code actually calls cpack of the string we give it right here, which in packs our string. And then with that result, we pass it into our SHA-2256, which is just a way for us to hash our string. And then once we have that result, we pass it to our hash string class that we define, which is our datum. And then we return that. And that returns our datum script, which is right here. And then we also pass in the amount we're storing. Passing these two parameters, we receive a transaction object. Let is just a dynamic variable, which can reference anything, and the compiler will figure out what the variable type is. So once we have our transaction, we need to send it across the network. And to do that, we call another function that Plus provides called submit transaction constraints. We give it the game instance, and then we also provide our transaction. And then if everything works correctly, then the user will save their ADA on the network. So that's lock. And we can talk at guess. So guess is very much the same as lock. Guess is a function that returns that same contract that we are expecting. And we're doing another IO action. And we're retrieving the user's input for guess, specifically the guess params which is just the user's guess, which is of type string. A typical procedure is we need to get the UTXO, which is the unspent output. UTXO add is another function that Plus gives us that gives us this input. And all we need to give it is the address of our script. I actually didn't include that in here. I missed it. But if you go back into the Plus program, you can take a quick peek of it. It's pretty straightforward. We're just giving the game instance to another function and that will give us the address of our blockchain. And so once we have our unspent output, which we need later on to submit our request, we need to define our redeemer type. And to do that, we call another function called clear string, and then we give it the guess that these are made. If we look at clear string, it takes in a type string, which we passed in, and then it returns our datum. So if we look at the implementation, all we do is we, with the string that we're provided, we pack into a byte string, and then we pass that value to our clear string, and then we return that. Now that we have our redeemer type, we can make our transaction. So on the side that is redeeming, we typically just call another function that Plus provides called collect from script. We give it our unspent output and our redeemer, and that will return us our transaction. Now with our transaction, we have everything we need to try and to collect our ADA. So we call the function submit transaction constraint spending. We pass in our game instance, our unspent output, and our transaction. And that will make the request of blockchain to redeem the ADA. And that's actually all we need to understand to write the guessing game. And that's it for the guessing game project. As you can see, there hasn't really been anything new this time around that we haven't seen before in our previous videos. So that's definitely a good sign that we're learning something. And as an extra credit, you can go check out the guessing game project that we've made in our one of our earlier videos, if you haven't seen it before, and take what you've learned and try to understand what's happening there. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. We love to engage with other people who are learning. Otherwise, if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button and maybe even consider subscribing to get updates for our next video, which we're going to talk about something a lot more complicated. But until then, I'll catch you later.